Hello again, everybody, and welcome to this If Oxford event tonight about Greek mythology and its connection with politics. Today, we're going to be exploring Hellene Europa and the politics of diversity. And in the image on your screen is a painting of Europa standing on the right with her billowing scarf, sitting on a bull with the sea behind her, looking rather radiant and almost as if she hasn't had a Zoom and internet technical failure. She's looking very content and calm. And these are the sorts of things we want you to comment on as part of this event about the politics of diversity. The standard format is uh, we will show a brief film that lasts for five minutes or so that acts as a conversation starter for what we hope to do with you as this event unfolds. We're asking, we're asking you to become a participatory Greek chorus. And we'll do this by breaking you out into the Zoom enabled breakout rooms. And we will put you into these small groups to discuss the question that will be presented to you by Europa. Um, we're gonna play the film and then we will start the live part and open up to the breakout rooms. Many of us dream of a less polarized less aggressive, more inclusive politics, don't we? How do we change the tone of our democratic conversation? Well, I believe that mythology, including Greek myths, can help us. Myths are bubble bursting. They can temper our self-righteousness with their contradictions and irony. I even wrote a book about it. Haven't you guessed the answer all along? to Pandora's riddle of hope about our broken politics, that transformative power is with you. And in the spirit of ancient Athens, my hope is that my students and the wider audience may help me break the logics of hierarchy and authority that prevail when we produce and express knowledge. How? Well, we have immersive theater. Let's have immersive debating, immersive teaching. We all want to transform the world, don't we? Well, let's start with mutual recognition, the empathic recognition of our differences as we revel in our similarities. So, join me in the theater of recognition, an adventure in co-creating meaning in today's politics. An adventure that brings together philosophy, mythology, and theater. Your mission? To voice your mind as part of the chorus. What is a chorus, you ask? Well, to start with, a group of actors who stand together on the stage, commenting collectively or individually on the unfolding action. Their role? To impersonate us. You, the people, us, as say, concerned citizens or wise elders or upper class women and so on. Sounds very modern, doesn't it? In ancient theater, our chorus may announce or explain the action, whisper some backstory, share bits of wisdom, and generally help us suspend our disbelief and make the stage our own. A grudge wanting blood for the spilling of child blood. A grudge brooding only on seizing its blood due. They can talk or chant together, discuss with each other as individuals, or express their feelings and yours through dance, for instance. Above all, the chorus is opinionated, not just a passive witness. And so should you be. No? If you accept this mission, try to imagine yourself not as a passive audience, but as a member of a chorus. I will act out a character from an ancient story, and as I do, I may pause for a moment or two and turn to you. And as I do turn to you, feel free to speak up, jump in, interject, comment, disagree, give your opinion, express surprise or anger in the spirit of the chorus. 
or join others in laughter, expressions of joy, even burst into a song. And oh, if we happen to be together in the virtual world, maybe you can also write down a feeling, an idea or a thought to our resident Zoom chorus and they can read it out for you. Remember, this is an experiment. Anything goes. And together, through this method of immersive debating, we will explore some big questions of politics, inspired by stories and ideas that have been with us for thousands of years. Hello, everyone. It's incredible to meet you. I'm always late, you know, Europa? Always a few minutes late or a few hours or a few centuries. But you are here in the 21st century. And I hear that you, you like to gather on these strange, strange screens, two-dimensional, as a chorus, and that you've already met some of my contemporary hailing from the ancient times, thousands of years ago. Oedipus, Ulysses, Prometheus, Iphigenia. Well, all I can tell you is that I, Europa, I have stood the test of time even better than they have. Yeah, I hear this is me, and I hear you've resurrected me at different times, you know, starting with Ptolemy 2000 years ago, although I lived way before that. And then in the, what you call the Middle Ages, there was an abbey, the Saint Pierre, who invoked my name to, um, well, what did you do to create, to call for a union among all the peoples of a small continent at the tip of Eurasia? But sadly, in your hyper-polarized world now, now, I'm, I'm now invoked to divide by some tribes who worship me, want to appropriate me, use and me, use me. Others want to reject or even curse me. Even as I have become one of the symbol of your European Union in front of buildings and everywhere. So I've come back here to clear my name. Yes, yes, I am Europa. Uh, can you shout out what you know about me? What do you see? Please turn on your mics, be part of the story and tell me what you see. You're beautiful. You're, you're on a ball. You're, you're on a ball. You're flying. Yes. You're dangerous. <laughs> I may be. And if there is one thing you can all see about me is that indeed I was abducted by a bull. But there's so much more to me than that. And I feel that if only we could have a proper introduction, maybe your conversation in the 21st century about me could become a little bit more civil. Well, for one, you know, it wasn't any old bull. It was indeed Zeus who's enamored by my beauty and turned himself into one so he could carry me off. But the truth is, well, he did abduct me. It, it wasn't really a very consensual affair. It wasn't that pretty, you know, there was lots of red in this story. Um, and indeed, you kind of wonder about these old gods. What was Homer and those who invented them trying to tell us about the need for some moderation and temperance? Because if you don't, it all goes crazy, right? So how do you know who had to carry and who was it that who was carrying who in the end? I wonder, there's that some version of the stories. Yeah, we women, sometimes we have to carry on our shoulder. But let's come back to the origins. Do you know where I came from? Where I hailed from? Yes, yes, I hailed from the shore of Phoenicia. I was a Phoenician princess, says the story. And as a Phoenician princess, well, what do we know about Phoenicia? Yeah, well, there is one version of the story that my friends who were playing with me were a bit jealous 
because we were happy, but a bit bored in that world. But that's not exactly the truth of it all, you know. In the end, Phoenicia was, well, occupied the whole of East Mediterranean, what is now your Lebanon, Syria, Israel, Egypt, one of the most formidable foes of your Rome that came to actually symbolize me. So my story of origin has to do with the fate of Phoenicia itself, a great trading and cultural nation, ultimately sacked by Alexander the Great and subsumed in his Hellenic kingdom. So that's where the great fissure, the split between East and West began. And I have a foot on each side, literally. I may be traumatized by it, but it's funny how my ancient European identity um, relied on, on this very other, the Asian, and then yet I am the other. I am also the other. Perhaps that what it means for your Europa, that somehow as an ideal of translation and negotiation, you include your many others. It's all about the circularity, the influence turned back on each other. But the story, of course, doesn't stop there because where did Ulysses, where did Zeus carry me? Well, yes, I landed in Crete. He carried me to Crete, an island at the very edge of today's Europe, an island which is really telling us that Europe may be its own margins. The core of Europe may be Palermo or Lisbon or Helsinki or Dublin or Vilnius, frontier zones, the limes, the cosmopolitan limes, or the forgotten limes. And maybe this is what it's all about, the story of a Europe that was created at its limes. So the question becomes, who am I really? Who is this Cretan Europe? What can she tell us about the politics of diversity? in Europe today. For one, well, I belong to a family of hybrids, you know, like the most beautiful of them all. In fact, the most beautiful woman, Helen, Helen who was the goddess, um, who, was, who created a war. Here we have her. You remember all the many versions of Helen? Well, like her, I belong to the family of hybrid. She, of course, was a daughter of a swan, um, and another version of Zeus and Leda, a complex story we won't go into because I've been late, so we don't have time. But I'm also something else in the same family of things. I'm always, the Romans already, we find, you know, depicted me in movement. I'm always moving, fluid in every artist imagination. And in that movement, well, you know, I'm probably not as white as that. Maybe I can't be used to whitewash all sorts of European deeds in the world. Um, and indeed, perhaps what I'm all about is that I was myself a refugee, as you have refugees in the waters today. Yep, a refugee from the Middle East. Can you, would you have let me drown in the sea in sight of Lesbos and Sicily if you were sinking the very idea of me? So this is me, Europa. Some people say my name in Greek meant open-minded and others say it meant sunset and the, and the Occident. Others remind me that my son Minos built a labyrinth. I'm all about how hard it is to find our way a way to union, a way to accommodating diversity. So you see, dear Chorus, if you dig a bit deeper and a bit deeper, I'm not necessarily Rome. I am not the Christian Europe. I am Crete, a Cretan Europe. So this is what you get when you ask me who I am. Tell me, 24th century Chorus, what can you do to clear my name in your own world? Is it even possible? Is it even desirable? Can I inspire you to reimagine a better Europe? Chorus, I want to hear you. Your turn, your turn to speak. Tell me, Chorus, what can you do to clear my name in your own world?
Right. So as your Koryphoros, your Greek chorus leader, with that question presented to us, I'm now going to break you out into the small groups, into the breakout rooms, so we can have a conversation uh, and work through our answer, uh, answering this question that's on the screen. How can we clear the name of Europa? Again, if you would like to join, please do. And if you'd like to be quiet in the room, that's fine. But if you'd like to be vocal, please be vocal. So as your chorus leader, I'm going to offer you some guidance from what I think as the chorus leader. Europa will be speaking in a moment, I'm sure. Uh, but I find her as the chorus leader, I find her a problematic character because she represents too much. She came from somewhere and she's with us now and she represents something that's different to what I know and what I care about. I think she needs to, I think Europa needs to clear her name because she represents too much for me and I find it difficult to keep it all in one place. So I'm going to offer the opportunity for Europa to speak once more. If Europa is available to, and able to speak. Dear Chorus, I, I would like to hear your voice from the 21st century where Europe is invoked by so many people to say so many different things. And yet I, I am coming from other shores. Please tell me how today in the 21st century, you can clear my name. And this time, Greek chorus, I'm going to go in reverse numerical order. So I'm going to allow chorus three to offer their response. Um, so we just like to, as a chorus, um, maybe perhaps ask what you mean by clear your name. And we'd like to suggest that possibly um, that uh, way of thinking has to do with the kind of honor and respect culture throughout the world. Like when you think about clearing someone's name, it's um, to do with ostracizing someone um, who is maybe expelled from a community. They need to clear their name to come back into it. Um, and, and to us that maybe the, the uh, criticism might be that this way of viewing things is very much about an image, a global image, rather than uh, a kind of a more profound um, change. Uh, and maybe it's perhaps the wrong, not necessarily aim that we should be trying to trying to strive for. But of course, images are also important, and the way we interact with our images are important. But maybe we should keep them in balance with with other questions too. But the chorus also had um, internal discussion and, and uh, disagreement. Um, one of our members raised the idea that Europa is many things that. Um, for as much as Europe might ask for forgiveness, um, every uh, symbol of every continent of every culture has been guilty of crimes. And uh, that essentially Europe is also um, an identity and a people and uh, shouldn't be remembered simply through the legacy of colonialism. Um, but to that, I think we must um, come back to the position that Europe is, of course, many things, and Europa is, is many things, and um, this does depend on how she is viewed and from who she is viewed and why she is viewed. Um, and uh, also, as a passing note, uh, we think that a big distinction maybe should be made between Western Europe and Eastern Europe, the countries who um, actually carried out colonialization and, and those which didn't, so, so say us the chorus. Thank you, Chorus 3. That's very wise. I've had a message channeled through my technology as a 21st century choral leader. And the message is coming through as we believe, Europa, you need to be more honest about who you are, what you expect from yourself, what you expect from others. I think Chorus 2 may have something to say. Who is representing Chorus Group 2? Uh, Europa, we believe that you should start using your 
beauty for um, more sort of uh, construction rather than destruction. <laughs> and we believe that you should be less devoid if you would like to be even more beautiful and powerful with what you are doing. And so say you, Greek chorus too. And so says us. <laughs> That's another good comment. And now I'd like to return to chorus one, who normally gets to speak first, but this time we've changed it. We have instigated more confusion tonight with technology <laughs> and politics and game. Greek chorus one, what is your response? You, Europa. We Sorry, Miss Europa. <laughs> Europa, we believe that your desire to clear your name might be doing you some injustice, and we are worried about your need to feel that you need to clear your name. However, we thought about what was it that led you to feel that your name needed clearing and we thought about um, a sense of victimhood or a sense of being put on a pedestal of being too much desired and too much revered and all that um, all that pressure to have felt too much for you um, we understand that your the violence that you've endured had rippled throughout the world more than any other individual uh, conflict or um, or um, kind of crime. Not that there isn't enough of that all over the world, but your particular history has had the greatest of impacts globally. But we still want you to consider that you are not a victim and that we would like to hear more about why you feel like you need to clear your name. And so says us. Thank you, Chorus. I think my wise Chorus has now voiced their views. Europa, what's your response? Chorus, you wonder why I want to clear my name. And that is a, I, I understand that this itself is a strange question perhaps for you, Chorus, but then of course, you always from the wisdom of hindsight are able to collapse times. And I introduce myself by telling you about how I was this rather young, innocent, captured, abducted woman, but from outside what you call Europe today. And I was, and I landed just at, just at the margin of the Europe today. And yet what I see is that those who, and you ask, well, do I, why do I feel that I have to save something? My honor, am I a victim or was I too powerful? Have I been misrepresented? And all of this is true in my complex history. But if we look at today, there are, parts of the world in Europe's neighborhood, in Africa, in the Middle East, who think that all I can do is reject that I'm a fortress, that I don't really care about some others who are not my color um, and who drown in, in my seas. But that's, I, need, I want my name to be cleared because I was part of them. I was from that world myself. So I would hope that you citizens of the 21st century would remind your co-citizens that this is what I was, as you as you are just as you've just done. And indeed, uh, there are others in the world who feel that I've been too powerful, that I have been um, in trying to impose things. Well, you know, my Phoenician ancestors were indeed actually um, the victim of that power. But today, at the same time, there are those who think that. I don't speak loud enough against the big bullies of the world, that I'm too humble. Um, and maybe we have to remind them that maybe my strength is this diversity, this hybridity 
And I have to remind myself of that too. So yes, this is the many, many challenges that I face today. But I'm, my hope is that if you all remember who I really was, you can be inspired to be this more, this other Europe, this Cretan Europe. That is my hope. And with that hope, let me become, um, invite you back to our normal rooms um, where we can perhaps spend a few more minutes for those who, of you who want to stay um, and be ourselves. Um, <laughs> and um, ask you whether you feel that um, using Greek myth, and of course, some of you may want to leave uh, because we're way over time, but perhaps for a few more minutes before we end, I guess the question I wanted to get at is whether if we go back to mythology, to these stories, um, to trying to get the essence of a word, Europe, where did it come from? What this goddess was like? we can try to recover something about Europe that maybe has been lost. And that, that's, I think, partly what the chorus was trying to speak of. Thank you, Calypso. So everybody, uh, we're going to wrap this up in uh, 10 minutes at 20 past six. Apologies for it going over. Uh, I know some people have had to leave. They've got things that they need to do. Uh, the technical problem we had was um, obviously unforeseen. Uh, so we can have 10 minutes now just to reflect on tonight um, and the question of Europe as a, a character and also as a political kind of national um, grouping. But I think also if you wanted to kind of reflect, I mean, some of you have been to all of the sessions uh, and we've tried to edit the pattern of the event a little bit with this experiment, which has obviously been challenging and tonight has been no exception to that challenge. Um, but it would be really nice if you wanted to unmute uh, and offer, because we'd like to do this again, basically. Um, so we'd like to find a way um, to make this format work better. Uh, and we'd welcome your thoughts on this, uh, but also your thoughts on uh, the question of Europa as a political entity and also as a character from ancient Greece. So if you want to unmute yourselves and jump in, please do. Um, we're going to close this event in 10 minutes. Or less, because or, people or, are. Or less, depending. <laughs> if you need to go, please do and go. And I don't think we want to impose too much on their, no, no, on no. everybody's patience. No. So just, if you want to, if if you you want to, to go, share anything, yeah. as Porypheus just uh, suggested. Um, so. Sorry, there were some technical difficulties, so I didn't really uh, get the explanation from before. Um, but I think I heard about something that Europe, Europa was was also uh, receiving the same pain that uh, she later on maybe did to other people. But, uh, but yeah, I, I, I stopped from there. Um, I missed it. <laughs> Uh, that, yes, can you please explain a little bit? Arisha, we're, we're now in kind of mo reflexive mode. And I, I think that's a very, very good way of hearing the message. As someone from the chorus, this is something you might throw back at Europe. I understand, Europa, that you yourself, you were on the other side, you're at the margin, you were abducted and raped. So should you not be more sensitive are you today perhaps faithful to that past or not? What do you think? What do we think that Europe is Europe faithful to this mythical past? Of course, it is a mythical past, but it can inspire us be in being sensitive to Europe's others, to using Europe's own diversity to connect to the world because there is in Europe Algerians and Indians and Turks and those from beyond Europe who make part of your who are part of Europe or and from way beyond. Um, so by being all this, Europe could be, and if we could project that to the rest of the world, that we are this Cretan Europe, not Christian Europe, not an exclusionary Europe, but an inclusionary Europe. If we only we could project that, then maybe we would be a Europe that would be very popular in the world, whereas now there is very mixed feelings around the world about Europe. So how, Clip, so how does this 
relate so obviously the kind of the story of Europa the goddess has a backstory around diversity and um, rejection uh, and not maybe telling um, the full story as as best as the goddess could obviously we're seeing that now echoed throughout the political uncertainty across the European Union you know which seems like a you know, an, um, you know a piece of idiom that is very well represented in the story and so you know there are moments in time when Europe has been at obviously you know the war the world war one world war two um and the migrant crisis the refugee all of that kind of stuff the political kind of tension the economic kind of turbulence that you see from uh sort of western central Europe all the way through to kind of southern uh, Eastern Europe and the sort of diversity that's sort of causing the kind of single face of the European continent be shattered and un 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 misunderstood and despised, I suppose, in the way that the goddess's story had already kind of explored. Exactly. I mean, uh, we all perceive this, this Europe in crisis that Part of it is um, uh, that it's not, it's internal, it's not trying, it's not always succeeding in accommodating and being tolerant with its own diversity, different ways of doing things. Perhaps that's one of the key of Brexit, that it was very difficult to, to accommodate a very different country like Britain, exceptionalist, exceptionalism, you know, in their, in the mind and in the, uh, in the country. Um, and that, and externally, um, it's not always able to, in its foreign policy, to um, over, overcome the image of a kind of, um, you know, hegemon, neo-colonial, these kinds of things. Um, and that in, in some ways, when we Europeans try to have a narrative about Europe, they say, we are Christian Europe or maybe sometimes Greco-Christian Europe. And we have we are one and we have one story and it's this un Christian Europe with enlightenment. Um, and in, in, in telling that story, um, it, it reinforces an image that some of the those wary, the Eurosceptics have that Europe is this one big monolithic thing. Um, and that is a bit of a scary image. That's why a lot of people, not just in Britain, but elsewhere in Europe, fear Brussels. Um, so it's either that or, you know, the cartoon of Europe on her bull. The bull is all very nice. She's kind of cute. She was flying and we forget all of the underlying tensions um, that are actually in the myth itself, you know, about abduction and rape and all the rest and violence that is also the past of Europe. So there, I guess I'm trying to say something about how going back to the original myth can be more truthful to the complexity, but also the diversity of Europe and its um, foreignness. So thinking about Europa on the bull, again, people um, in the audience may want to offer some response to that. But it seems that when thinking about the kind of political markets, and we often use the phrase a bull market and a bear market. So when the economic downturn is happening, we might consider that a bull market, uh, sorry, a bear, a bear market where kind of economic decline and turbulence sort of follows. Whereas when there's a, a rising economic kind of tide and everything seems to be going nicely, Europa and the kind of uh, cross-border relations that the kind of different European nations had in the kind of, you know, 80s, 90s, the kind of millennium, things seem to be going really well in terms of the global economics. And so Europa is riding positively and quite well on the bull, actually. So the great, you know, people use the phrase the European gravy train. And then, and then all of a sudden, this sort of um, political confidence and economic sort of development began to fragment. And so the differentiated facets of Europa's um, projection returns to the national subunits. And so this tension then between the different states and the you know, disharmony that kind of comes out of the personality of the European continent 
uh, might be reflected in the Europe in Europa's personality um, disorder almost. Leah, you have a hand raised. What about um, others? Yes, all this makes lots of sense to me. Uh, yeah, Leah and Jorge, Danielle, Mary, Annalena, Arisha. My, my thought was that I felt that maybe this um, reference to Europa, it was a sense of um, trying to remind us of the origin, right? remind us of the fact that nobody comes from nowhere and no, nobody comes from any particular place as, as the myth says, and therefore we should try to fight against the sense of monolithic homogeny um, in general and more particular around the politics of Europe. Um, I thought that was what, a parallel that sort of jumped out to me in terms of um, the story you shared with us today, Calypso, and the myth and the, and the parallels with what we are looking at. Thank you. Yes. Thank you, Leah. Does anyone else want a, a last word from the chorus? Share any thoughts on on what it evokes? But maybe this is a very, very useful and and inspiring last word. Uh, mm. And maybe, of course, the point is that to let these stories rest in us because they're evocative, but they don't. They are about raising questions rather than providing answers. That's the whole point of using myth. It's that it's not some sort of straightforward given answer and that the, the diversity or even a small chorus like ours today, you know, the, the diversity of sentiments that are evoked by these stories shows that the conversation is wide open. And, um, and that we can each kind of pour our imagination in this Europe the way we want. And we, when we have conversation, we can use her <laughs> to make some point, but that point is not predetermined. So I just wanna thank everyone. And this is our very last um, uh, session. So I think we can all thank the Corey Theus. <laughs> who is uh, the leader of our chorus. <laughs> and, uh, and I would like to thank my wise choral members that have come back uh, and our new choral members tonight. Uh, I think you've been really brave uh, in embarking on this slightly bonkers uh, mission of exploring politics through the lens of uh, ancient Greek mythological stories and experimenting with our technology that we have at the moment. Um, of course, you know, Greek technology was some writing, some speaking, and our 21st technologies um, are writing and speaking, but mediated by this other, um, this other, other substance called the internet and Zoom. And maybe these, maybe another event in the future is what are our new gods doing for us and how can we subvert them? Uh, and how are our lives changing because these new technologies are imposing their will upon humanity? I don't know. Um, but thank you again for playing ball. Uh, it's been a struggle, uh, but it's been really fun, really interesting. Um, and when you do have some feedback, um, when so hopefully there'll be an email that comes into your inbox, um, we really would like to have some feedback because I think this experimental format has quite a bit of mileage to kind of develop. Um, obviously, we've learned a lot over the past four sessions um, about how we encourage you to ask questions, how we facilitate the engagement, how we feed back, how we present. So the different ways that uh, Calypso has been a great sport for the past four sessions. Um, so Calypso's ordinary job is a professor of international politics uh, and has put on um, a theatrical mask um, over our extended Oxford Science and Ideas Festival period. Uh, so I think I'd like to kind of offer my congratulations and applause for Calypso's humour, uh, creativity and willingness to play the game, um, to have these conversations extend. So uh, thank you, Calypso, for this opportunity. Thanks, uh, Leah and Nina, who's been sort of part of the production team uh, as well, um, roped into these sessions. And then my colleague, Cathy, as well, who's been roped into these. Um, again, it's been a huge amount of fun. Thanks so much for joining us. And maybe we'll, maybe we'll see you some, uh, at some more If Oxford events. 
uh, over the next few days before the festival closes on the 31st of October. That's it for me. Thanks so much, everybody. Good night. <laughs>